Praise God. We also have, bring me some Facebook and the, the new postcards so we can have them so you can hand out those from now on. And just in case there's somebody here for the first time, amen. We welcome you to Shiloh, but I'm gonna give the I'm gonna give the microphone over to Pastor Dora and she's going to talk to uh, how, how many uh, is she gonna talk to you? You know, there's a lot of beautiful uh, uh, postcards that you could take with you. Because some of you may go to your family's house or some of you may be with your friends and you say, my God, you should have heard the message I learned about God on Sunday. Woo, that was a good one. And you say, oh, here's a postcard. You can watch it. It's on, it's on Facebook. You can watch what I listen to. See, you are the evangelist. That's who you are. You're the servant of God. You're the messenger of God. And God uses you. So grab some of those postcards because we got a lot of them. And keep them with you in your purse. They're not about this big. They're small enough to put in your purse. So you can grab one out and you can share the word of the Lord. Praise God. A lot of people say, oh, that was a great word. Now let's share it. Amen. Sharing is what? Sharing. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we're talking about the connection card, which is this one here. If no one has one or ever had one and you would like one, please raise your hand. And we can distribute one to you. What these are, it's a prayer request. What you do is fill out your name. Put out your prayer request, and every day someone will be praying for you. We have a prayer team that's Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursday, uh, Fridays, and a Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays. So every day, your prayers being your, your prayers are being sent before the Lord, not only with you but with our brothers and sisters here that pray. And also, we have these cards here to go on Facebook, I'm mean, to go, it takes you Facebook to and Facebook and, and YouTube. Yes. Yeah, and to YouTube. Um, it's wonderful, you just 
put your phone here and press the yellow button and it'll connect you. And that's all you have to do. So if you need any of these, please raise your hands. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Don't forget to grab some of the postcards that are made for you and your family and your loved ones. You understand that they're for you. They're for you to spread the word. And that somebody, I want you to know that somebody invited me every Sunday. They took their time and called me up every single Friday. And you know what I told them every Friday? I have a hangover, I can't go. I told them no so many times, but do you know they never gave up on me? I'm serious, she, I, her name was Hilda. When she would visit my church, I had her stand up. She, I'd have her stand up and everybody would hand clap, you know. This was the one that got me here by just being persistent. Even though I kept telling her, no, I'm in Vegas today. No, she still called me and this is why the Lord is going to use you to invite people. Believe me, God knows how to get a hold of people's heart even when they look like they won't even say yes to God. That was me. Praise God. But he put me in this atmosphere and the power of Satan began to be broken in the church. And that's where uh, one of the services I went to, I left with something of God. And that began to grow inside of me like a seed. Amen. But today I want to, and we could bring my, my um, uh, let's see, let's bring the spirit, soul, and body, please, brethren. And bring me my old pulpit here because I'm going to use something out there. I want to read something. Before I do, we have here, uh, can we put the poster up for Purim? How many know that we have a school of ministry? A school of ministry that is um, blossoming in March. If you live in the La Puente area, if you live in the La Puente area, we're opening up a school of ministry in La Puente on, somebody help me, I think it's March the 17th. It's a Friday night. We have a school of ministry. We've got a lot of registrations that are coming in. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and uh, so if you live in that area, you can begin your school of ministry. That one will be 20 weeks. We teach the history of God's word. We teach the biblical calendar, which is not in English. It's in Hebrew. It's really beautiful when you learn the history so that you can become literal and then prophetic. That means you'll be able to extract a lot of revelation when you understand God's word, the history, the move of the spirit. And how the Holy Spirit moved upon his people in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. So you learn about the Torah, you learn, learn about the Hebrew letters. You just learn a whole different world. Amen. It's like you go in with a scuba diving. Have you ever went underwater and then you're sleeping? Huh? You see flowers you've never seen before because they live only underwater. Okay. And you're in the water. Like, oh, how pretty. Like, oh, right. This is the word of God. When you get deep, you see things you've never seen before. Amen. Amen. And this is what God, uh, his beautiful word that he begins uh, to impart in you through the wisdom of the word of God. So uh, we, uh, we st well, I think we're in class number maybe five or six. You're st you can still jump on board if you want to join us. Uh, so we have a Tuesday night class and we have a Friday, Thursday night class. No, wait a minute. Tuesday and then Wednesday, all at 6.30, straight teaching. And then we have, we're going to be opening up one in, uh, up within Fridays. And that will be done on March, I think, 17th, and it's a Friday. If not, it's on Facebook. We put the announcements there. Now, before I begin, I wanted to invite here is uh, it's this. If you are in the School of Ministry, you will be attending. We will be having the Purim. It's the, the, it is the celebration of Queen Esther, which is in your Bible, the book of Esther. You also have in your workbook, which is uh, if you're in the School of Ministry, you also have a workbook that talks about the spirit or the demon Amalek. That, those two handouts, I'll be giving you a picture so you could bring them with you because I need you to learn, you need to learn uh, about Purim, about the reversal of the writings um, and, and that were against the, the, the nation of the Jews in the times of Persia. So you're going to learn how we also have war with that evil spirit which is called Amalek and it's in the book of Exodus chapter 17 where God himself said this the Lord said you will have war with Amalek from generation to generation and you are a generation amen so that will be a celebration we will be having a dinner and it's absolutely free and that will be on the, the uh, this will be the 7th of March at 6 30 they will the two the two schools the two classes are going to be uniting here. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays class. And anybody from the church that would like to attend, you can also attend the dinner. And then not only that, the celebration and the education of what it, what what Pur Purim is or Purim in your Bible in Esther chapter 8 and 9. 
and you learn history, not only that, but you're going to learn how to war <coughs> against that enemy that you can't recognize. Because look, at if you can't identify, you can't what? You can't conquer. So he will be exposed and deposed. I mean, disposed out of your life, praise his name, and your generation. Amen? So I, I wanted to share that, so that's for sure. So I want to open up with a few scriptures here because I want to talk a little bit about King David. How many remember that the Lord said there is an art of war? Okay. Okay, I want that language art. I mean, do you know what the word art means, right? Has anybody does anybody go to a museum and you look at art, you know? I don't know, I'm not into art. Are you into art? You know, some people spend hours, look at that painting. <laughs> wow, the colors. Look at the brush strokes on that. It just talks to you. People admire art, right? Yes. They admire it. Well, some of us don't, but this is what God says. It's the art of war. Look at it. Look at the moves. Uh -huh. Look Look at how it's done. Study the art of war. Because God does not want you all beat up. He wants you to be strong in the name of Jesus and in the Lord. And in the Lord is the word living and breathing in you. Okay, so when you, you begin to walk in a spiritual confidence of who God created you to be. And, and you're, not, you're not moved with emotions and winds of doctrines and things you see in images and pictures. You, you don't go there. You have the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're up here, and you're looking down, saying, "Hey, hold on. But you're up, in, you're up in a supernatural place of authority with God, such a place of peace, such a place of dominion, and you know that every day God is working for you. You know that every day that you wake up in the atmosphere, in the presence of the Lord, presence of the Lord, waking up, saying, "Lord, I praise you, Lord. Let's just get what we have to get done today, Father. I want to enjoy my day because I walk with God." You see, and I'm going to be a vessel of God. That's going to be a vessel of honor. And I'm not going to let the enemy run me. I'm not going to let him put images in me. I'm not going to let me let him let me look in the back. There ain't nothing there but the devil himself trying to pull you back, take you out, and start the same narrative in you. You already know this, right? You're learning a lot at Shiloh, and you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be a king, a warrior, like like really on you know like a, like special forces, like you know. Like, a soldier, like SEAL team, how's that? You look at those guys, you're like, ah, oh, they're underwater for so long, right? I mean, they just like go through a lot, you know? So this is what I want to raise up, special forces in the army of God here at Shiloh. Praise the Lord. That's an honor. Okay, so then here we see 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which were before concerning you, that thou, that, that thou by them Midas wage a good warfare. Now look at he gives Timothy, Paul the Apostle gives Timothy a charge according to the prophecies that were given to him that you war and you engage, I want to say, in a good warfare. Why is it good? Because God already conquered the enemy. Now you gotta conquer him. You gotta walk in the wisdom and the authority of God. That you wage a good warfare. And King David, and as we looked at King David, God began to show us how David, since he was a young man, how he came and he, he came against different difficulties in taking the kingdom for God. We know that things began to be manipulated around him. He know, we know that he became he came under attack with people that he loved, he admired, and he honored. And what the people around him did, which were his own brothers, is they began to label him. When he was only 17, 18 years old, he's only taking them some food. And they said, what are you doing here, his brothers say, his older brothers. What are, what are you, full of pride? He said, we know your naughtiness. And all he was doing was taking them a meal. Remember the story. So they began to try to label him. And one of the art of warfare is, everybody say ignore criticism. Come on, we've been doing it. Ignore criticism. You understand that? You, we don't, ignore criticism. Criticism Number two, we know that David, we know in the journeys that he was in, he had to, listen, he had to encourage himself in the Lord. Amen? Amen. He had to say, I'm, I'm good. Hey, God's with me. You know, I killed a lion, I conquered drugs, I conquered alcohol, I left my exes in Texas over there. I'm, not there. I'm good. I don't have nobody living in my soul. I'm good. Rehearse your victories. I mean, and then of course the third art of war strategy that God that God gave David and that David applied in his life 
was also watch your words. Watch your words. Do you know your thoughts are words, right, everybody? You know that you have an internal dialogue that are words that are coming from your what? Conscience and your soul. Yes. Very good. You're on it. Praise God. You didn't say spirit. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So we know that, you know, God is building in you. He's building his temple, his image, his likeness. He's building himself in you because you are the temple of God. Praise his name. So we know that the art of war. So I want to talk today about David because we see here that David in 2 Samuel 6, 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And he was girded in a linen ephod. So we know that. So I brought, I have a breastplate here behind me. And the breastplate that was connected to the ephod. The ephod is a part of the priestly garments. And wherever David went, listen, in the times of war, he began to travel with the priest and the ephod. Amen? So let's look at scripture again. Here we see here. And uh, we, we're going to also know that David faced his giants. Everybody say face your giants. Come on. So we have to face the fears. We have to face whatever, we're, especially what we're afraid to look at. And a lot of times we got to look at ourselves. Amen. And sometimes the giant's inside of you. You got a narrative inside that's a giant that is rooted in your subconscious mind. The root of rejection, the root of abandonment, whatever, whatever is inside your soul that has become a giant that's trying to conquer. Listen, conquer what God is trying to build in your life. So we have to face what is inside of us. And we've got to take responsibility for what is out of the order of God. See, I believe God is the God of order and he brings us into divine order. Amen? So look at that scripture. We want to see, continue the word. It says, and uh, 1 Samuel 30, I want to read the scripture. And David said to Abathi, Abathi or the priest, he said, he said, I pray thee, bring me the ephod. So here we see that David traveled with the ephod. And that is a priestly garment. How many know God says you're kings and priests, right? Yes. Remember, if you're in the school of ministry, you're learning the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of David, the, 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 the temple of Solomon. And we're going to get into the garments that the priests wore. Why? Because God designed everything. Amen? And if God designed it and he gave it to us, don't you want to wear it? Yes, spiritually, these are garments that we wear. Praise the Lord. So we know that uh, David is now in the time, we're going to step into the time where David is going to be warring against King Saul. We're going to look at the characteristics and the personality traits of the king that fell, the king that lost his authority, the king that lost his position, the king that lost his job, and the king that lost the anointing. He lost all of that because of his character, his personality traits, and because of his rebellion and his pride to do it his way. Everybody say, God is a God of order. Thank you so much. Remember that. I have to remember that. I say, God is a God of order. I'm, all, I'm out of order here. When I'm in the soul, I got to say, Whoa, I'm out of order, right? Because it's what? Spirit, soul, and body. Hey, come on. The art of war. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Say, get out of the soul. Gee, I'm not in the spirit right now. So recognize it, okay? So King Saul, his kingship, his authority, his job, his anointing, okay? Number one, King Saul's characteristics. Remember, it was, uh, if you're in the school of ministry, remember, it was King Saul, King David, right? King Solomon, and then King Rehoboam, and then there was a split in the nation. So King, king Saul was the first king that God ordained, and he was from the tribe of what? Benjamin. Because Benjamins were warriors. Most of them were left-handed. So God chose, chose the first king to be from the tribe of Benjamin. And the scripture describes him in, in the book of, oh, here, in 1 Samuel 9, 2. Look at, look at his statue. I got you. I need you to look at this. He says this, and King Saul, and there was a man whose name was Saul. Listen, handsome. El Wapo, handsome. There was not a man in the people of Israel more handsome than him. Watch this. And his shoulders were upward. He was tall and handsome. And he had insecurities. And he had jealousy issues. Think about this. And because of his insecurities, his jealousy, then what happened with him? What happens when you have insecurities and jealousy? Watch this. You begin to want to manipulate and control. So this was, he was, he was handsome. He had it all. And yet, 
within his soul, he began to operate under the spirit of pride and rebellion and stubbornness with the Almighty God. God put him in a great position, everybody. God gave him the ability to succeed, even El Wapo stuff. Come on, he was tall and handsome on top of the anointing. And not only that, but God called him and put him amongst prophets, and they were all prophesying. See, that was for prophecy, just like the Lord says in the book of Timothy. He said, be faithful to the prophecies that are that are in you. You have the prophecy of the word. You have the prophecy of Jesus Christ. You have the prophecy that your spirit man is sitting one with God, that you have the Holy Spirit living in you. There's a prophecy in you also. Well, maybe you don't think you're dark, I mean, you're, dark. you're handsome and tall. But I want you to know that he had it all. And yet, he allowed his characteristics his personality traits. He allowed the spirit of jealousy, intimidation, watch this, to, uh, to live and breathe in him when he had it all. So we see here that David is assigned to Saul to help him destroy his enemies. Think about this. They're being taunted by a giant. Listen to the word, because some of you got giants inside of you. Taunted, harassed, provoked, the God, Goliath the giant did that for 40 days and nobody would fight that giant. Here comes a little skinny old David comes and he takes down the giant. Right there, Saul said, I want him as a bodyguard. Bring him to me. He's coming into my army. So now David's now in the army and he's one of King Saul's right hand men. So he begins to listen. He was a musician. David was a psalmist. So Saul began to rebel against God because, we, because what he did is he didn't want to wait on God and he went into the temple and did his own offerings. So of course the prophet comes to correct him and he gets very angry about being corrected. How many know if you get angry when you're corrected, you're on order? Amen. And I say corrected by God. Not your God people. I'm talking about God. God's word correcting you. Amen. Yeah, well, I'm always correcting my husband. You know. <laughs> yeah, what you want. No, I'm <laughs> but so so the so the, the correction came from the prophet and he got very offended. Okay, if you have an offended conscience, you're gonna have what? A wounded conscience. If you have a wounded conscience, you have a what? Weak conscience. If you have a weak conscience, you have a what? Idle conscience. And if you have a weak, what idle, defiled, and offended, then you're gonna have a what? Defiled and dirty conscience. It rolls like that, very simple. It never just ends with one thing. The enemy builds and builds and builds and builds on that one offense. That one, it's not fair. That one, I don't like. That one, I don't deserve. Oh, that is the beginning, the beginning of Satan building inside of you. Amen? So we see here, so Saul's goal is to be in control, leaving the order of God. He wanted to attack, dominate, and manipulate David, Saul inject fear and intimidation in the whole nation of Israel, turning the nation of Israel against David. You have to understand that David killed the giant. He became very popular. Not only that, when they went to war, David would travel with Saul. And when they were coming back from war, the people began to cheer for David and King Saul. Except they said David killed 10,000 and Saul killed 1,000. I would have turned around and said, as Saul, I would have said, thank you, David, for killing 10,000 of our enemies. But that's not Saul. Because Saul can't be grateful. Saul doesn't like when somebody else succeeds. They want to be in charge. Everybody say, out of the order. Come on. Out of the order of God. We don't want to be out of the order. You're learning some powerful principles for life here. Amen. So he Saul was jealous and insecure. He was on, Saul was on a mission to ruin David's reputation and assassinate his character. Everybody say character assassination. Assassinators. Character assassinators. That's like it unto Saul. Okay. Not only that, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and his attempt to control through me through any means except the Holy Spirit. Amen? So here we see, you can't see it very well, but here's David at 17. Here's David taking down the giant. Of, <coughs> look at this. The three soldiers here. I bet you one was Ab uh, Abashai, the one we've been talking about. Amen? Here are your giants, okay? The giants' narratives that hold you hostage and control your, control your soul. The giants 
Listen, narrative. Everybody say the sound. Come on. The giant's narrative, the sound inside of you that wants to control your focus and your emotions. Are you hearing the Lord? I'm telling you, those are giants inside of you. You got to take them down before they take you down. Are you hearing the Lord? The giants, the narratives inside of you. It's not you anymore. You understand that? If it's taking you to a language, like it unto King Saul, away from the peace of the Holy Spirit living in you, then you know, hey, there is a giant that is surfacing in my conscience. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The, all they want to do is control your soul with bad language, bitter roots, and fault finding. The King David had an opportunity to, king, to kill King Saul. We've seen that when Abashai said, I'll take him out in one shot. That's all I need is one shot. I call him the one shot soldier. The one shot, the one that wanted, the one that wanted to cut the head off. Saul's uh, family member that was was insulting David. And this is the same soldier that took out 300, Abashai. And not only that, but he's the one that told King David, there he is, the Lord delivered him into your hands. Let me do it. And he said, no, we will not touch God's anointed. One thing about David is he listened to God. Yes, he made mistakes, but he was so quick to repent. How many know we make mistakes? But all you got to do is say, I'm sorry, God. I, I messed up, God. I got in the soul, God. I went in the language of God. I was looking at the wrong thing, God. Oh, my God, I was saying the thing. Do you understand? Identify and conquer. Amen. So we see that David, David is now running. I mean, Saul is on him so bad that the whole, uh, most of the nation turned against David. Now Saul is on a high pursuit. His focus is to take David and kill him. But of course, of course, David and, and Saul's son, Jonathan, have a, have a covenant with each other. And we know that Jonathan went to Saul, I mean, went to David many times and said, my dad's not going to kill you. I mean, he made any way possible to try to distract his father from finding him. But I want you to know that at the time that David is going to experience the greatest breakthrough in his life is at the worst place in his life. This is where the breaking point was. This is where finally he goes into Jerusalem. You've got to hear the message. Because some of you are at your breaking point. Some of you are just ready to cross over into Jerusalem. And as King David did, he established the kingdom of David. And he took the land from, Jeruz to, from, Je from the Jebusites and took Jerusalem, his final destiny, where now he was going to build, to listen, a city for his people. Isn't that beautiful? But you're going to see it was the worst place of his life. And sometimes we, when we're at our worst place in our life, we think that God has abandoned us, but he's not. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. Amen? Listen to the Holy Spirit. So David is running from, from, David is running from, from Saul. And, and what happens is that he, he has to run to the land of the Philistines, the one where he killed 10,000. Him and his soldiers run to the Philistines because he knows Saul and their great army are not going to go into the land of the Philistines. That was the, Remember that Goliath was one of the Philistines? So David has to go to the enemy's land to be safe from a king that he loved. A king that he was a bodyguard to. A king, listen, and the people that shouted and praised him at the time he was a right-hand man for Saul. And now him and his soldiers are running and they're going into the land of the enemy. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in the land of the enemy. But that's where he can only find safety from the king Saul and the armies that are pursuing him. And, and, the pers and they're real close at getting them. So we see here that he goes and God gives him favor with Achash. Because how many know that God can give you favor in the midst of your battle? Yes. Oh, yes, he can. God gives him favor with the king of the Philistines. He just liked him. Oh, listen, David, I'm going to tell you what. Come and join us, him and his soldiers. And he tells him this. I'm going to give you a land so you have something of your own. So he gives them the land of Ziglag. So there's David and his soldiers having a land in the enemy's camp, and it's called Ziglag. Everybody say Ziglag. Ziglag. Now this is very prophetic because some of you be in Ziglag right now. <laughs> no, really, you're in Ziglag. And you've been living in Ziglag too long, okay? And you got to get out of Ziglag because I'm going to tell you one thing. 
David was there and the soldiers were there, but they weren't comfortable because they're in the land of the Philistines. They're not in their land of their family. They're in Ziglag. And that word Ziglag means to be pressed and weighed down. The word Ziglag means to be depressed for battles and years and years. And he went to Ziglag. It's a place where I quit. It's a place where you say I'm done. It's a place where you say I'm giving up. It's a place where you say, God, can we ever move from here? It's a place for one thing after another, after another, after another thing begin to happen. That's what everybody says Ziglag. That's what Ziglag means. Not only that, it's a place that we know where people go, where people that you thought had your back don't got your back anymore. They abandon you. Everybody say, I might be in Ziglag. Oh, David was in Ziglag. Achash, the, Achash, the king of the Philistines, they're enemies. Goliath's family member, if I could say it like that. They're living in that land. And I, sometimes you say, Lord, take me on that journey and help me see where I'm at. Because sometimes we are so consumed with the war that we're in, we can't see God. We're so consumed with that narrative in us, we're just stuck. Zig like they were stuck in the land of the enemy. Now we see here, so, so of course, for David, uh, according to Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says, when you've done everything you can, stand. And that's what David did. I, I just done everything already, Lord. I'm just gonna stand. I'm gonna stand in faith because I know he's traveling with the what? He's traveling with the what? The ephod. He's traveling with the ephod. Amen. He's traveling with the priest, and he's gonna be starting to inquire God more and more and more. Because I'm telling you, if you study the life of David, he's always asking God. He's always asking God. He gets stuck. He gets trapped. He calls for the ephod. So now he's in Ziglag, and of course he's gonna he's gonna he's going to call upon God because the worst thing in his life happens in Ziglag. He goes to war and he has his families, the soldiers and their wives and their children. He's traveling with family members from his soldiers, and they have a family that they have to be traveling with from land to land, running from Saul. They can't even find no rest. And that's what the enemy does. He pursues you, and he doesn't want you to rest. He don't want you to lay your head down on the pillow and knock down. He wants to be talking to you in your thoughts all night long. Toss and turn, toss and turn, toss and turn. That's the enemy. And he doesn't want you to just have peace. And this is the life with, with David in the time of war with Saul. Very, 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 he was, Saul manipulated. He, he was a manipulator. Listen, he wanted all the attention to himself. Oh, he loved attention, mm, whether good or bad. He liked drama. Everybody, drama, drama king. Little drama with you. Always a big old drama. I know you're not like that. Just in case. <laughs> okay, so then here it is. First Samuel 27. Let's pick it up for the teaching. Look at the teaching. We're learning something. One year and four months he was in what? Ziglag. In First Samuel 31, 6, and it came to pass. It says, when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites, here we are, the there it is, generation. The Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. The only land that he had in the that he had that had been given to him by Achash, the king of the Philistines, they burned the city down. Now you don't even have a land in it. It's all quemado, burned to the ground. And not only that, and then tell me what could go worse. And then, and then what happened is that is that they took the they took all the women, all the wives of the soldiers and David's wives, and, and they took their children. And so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned to fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. They come back, and everything's gone. Can you imagine the soldiers, their babies are gone? Can you imagine the soldiers, their wives are gone? Can you imagine David, his kids are gone? And the, there's no city. Even in the enemy's camp, he got burned when he thought he had a place just for a little safety. So what does David do? But David what? In verse 5, he what? Encouraged himself in the Lord. Everybody say the art of war. Come on. Ooh, yeah. How could you encourage yourself when all the kids are gone? How could you encourage yourself when you lose everything? But he did. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. You know that word encourage, it means support, confidence, hope, 
Listen, cheer up, lift up, inspire, motivate, stir up, fire yourself. Lord, I can do this. Lord, give me the direction. Lord, uh, you have me kill the lion, the bear. You gave me victory over the, the Edomites, the Amorites. The, I fought these words. He had to encourage himself with the Lord. And then he says this, bring me the ephod. So he gets the ephod, gets the priest, and he gets that. And the, the soldiers were not happy campers. They were very upset with David. Even his soldiers turned against him. And all he had left was God. That's all you need is God. That's all you need. He's your king. He's your God. He's with you. You're never alone. Do you understand? You, you're never without the Holy Spirit. He's always there. Give him an ear so you can hear him. So then David gets the ephod and the lead tells the Lord, Lord. And David said to Abiathar the priest, I pray thee, bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought him the ephod. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after the troop, the enemy? Shall I? And then David said, Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered David. And the Lord said, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, the Lord said, you're going to recover everything that the Amalekites took from you. Amen. Can you think about this? He had to turn on his soldiers. Uh, soldiers, uh, soldiers, I spoke to the Lord. <laughs> I brought the ephod. And I asked God what to do. And he said that we're going to pursue the enemy. And we're going to, we're going to, listen, we're going to get everything back. How do you think they're like, what? Or did they believe in the king? Did they have faith in the king? Did they believe that David had a relationship with God and was on an assignment to establish a kingdom for God? They had faith in God. And they had faith in David. Give God a hand clap. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Samuel 39. And so David went and he, look at 600 men. Look at, that were with him, they all came to the brook and says, there were those who had, there were those who left behind stayed, but they, David pursued, he had 400, 400 men, for 200 stood behind, which were so faint, they were so weak, they, they were so, uh, so uh, weak and they had no strength that they could not even go over the brook. David, David suffered, listen, David had 600 soldiers, watch this, and on the journey, 200, 200 of them passed out because they're so exhausted. They had just came back from a war. They came back from war, they came back, their people are gone, their family's gone, and now they're going to another war, watch this, the Amalekites that have their children and family, and David's going with his 600, and then turns around and 200 are gone. I'm like, oh my God, everybody say the art of war, come on. What did he have to do? What do you think he did? The Lord told me, Listen, 400 soldiers, God told us, we're going to pursue, we're going to overtake, and we're going to recover all. So can you imagine David and the strength of especially his 33 special forces? They go and they destroy the Amalekites and they recover all their children. They recover, listen, their wives, and they even got the spoil of the, the Amalekites. Give God a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Amen. So now, listen. He's at Ziglag, and something happened at Ziglag. I want you to know that <clears throat> King, the, the, the crown that was upon the head of King Saul, Saul dies on the battlefield in Gilboa. Him and his, his sons, and I, 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 I'm gonna say this, but you know, the sons of Saul were caught on the crossfire of all the rebellion and pride. You know what we do affect our children, right? Do you, do you want to hear that? It's what we do affect our children. That's why we got to stay in the spirit. we got to be parents of prayer, parents of faith, so our children will follow the lineage of Jesus Christ and the prophecies of God. They deserve a chance, amen? They deserve God like we receive the Lord. Even when we make mistakes, we make our right choices, and this is they're going to follow the Lord because you're following him. But anyways, David and his, uh, excuse me, Saul and his sons get killed in the battlefield and they're dead. And a soldier, an Amalekite, goes and he sees Saul and Saul's trying to fall on his sword. 
He's trying to commit spiritual suicide. Really, I call it spiritual suicide. But he gets on the sword because he knows if the enemy gets him, because they're all dying there. All the soldiers, so many of them were lost. And so the Saul is on the ground. He's trying to put the sword on him. And he sees an Amalekite pass by. He says, son, come and help me. Just They're going to take me. I'm going to die anyway. I'm bleeding all over. I'm paraphrasing it. He said, help me just fall on my sword. So he, he pushed him and helped him, you know, die or, or, or get killed with his own sword. Because he killed himself with his own sword. Is that prophetic or not? You know, isn't it prophetic what he did? It's prophetic what we do. So anyways, he dies. And then so he gets the crown. He takes his crown and his bracelet, the Amalekite. The Amalekite. Remember the Amalekite. That word in numerical value, if you study the Hebrew letters with us in our school, that those the way Amalek is spelled is the same way that you spell doubt and unbelief, which will kill you. Huh? That's just a little secret there that you'll learn. But um, so they take the crown to David. So they said the Amalekite has something for you. And he lays it at the feet of David, King Saul's crown. And he's an Amalek. I mean, he's an he's a Ziglag. So Am, the Amalekite comes and tells David, "I have to tell you something. Saul and and his sons are dead. And David said, is Jonathan dead? Yes, he's dead." He goes, "And what happened?" He goes, "I." He said, "Help me put the sword upon myself because help me because I know I'm going to die anyway." He said, "They're going to get me. They're going to torture me, and they're going to hang me and shame me." So he helped. He said, "I helped him, you know, lay out his sword. He was going to die anyways, David." He said, and I know that you've been or you've been anointed king. Remember, three times he was anointed. And on the third time he finally perceived. So he gives David the crown, and David's not a happy camper about that. He didn't say, Oh, that's what he gets for messing with me. He finally got what he deserved. Uh -huh, well, I told you it was gonna happen. Look at guys, we got it. We're the best. I'm so anointed. It's not the way he talks. Oh no, David, the Bible says that God said he has a heart like mine. The heart of God is merciful, compassion. The heart of God isn't rude. It isn't, isn't boastful. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is not, look at me and I want to be in charge. And you got to listen to me and I'm going to release you and get aspiration. Well, that's not the heart of God. Are you getting it yet, Saul? Have you seen your character, Saul? So David is not happy. Number one, you Amalekite touch the king. You think you're doing me a favor by putting your hands on the king? And the Bible says that, that David mourned for Jonathan and Saul. He said the anointed of Israel has died. He called Saul the anointed of Israel. That's how deep love he had. He loved his family. He loved his king. His king Saul just got crazy and pursued him. But if you listen to Saul, to David, excuse me, David's Psalms, you could see his heart in the times of war. And so, of course, Saul, uh, King David kills the Amalekite that you touch God's uh, anointed. And not only that, so now David has the crown. And remember, who anointed him to be king? God did. So he puts the crown on. And now he said, let's go to Jerusalem. So all the soldiers are, everybody say, leaving Ziglag. Come on. They're going to leave Ziglag. Finally get out of Ziglag. Huh? So they leave Ziglag and now they're going to Jerusalem. And guess who's in Jerusalem? Everybody say the Jebusites. I feel still the Jebusites. That they are living there. There's a fortified wall. It is like impossible to go into Jerusalem. That's how strong the Jebusites were, that's how the strategy of their war was, that they had the land of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem but belonged to David and his family, to the Israelites. So we know that he's at, he's at the place, the Je here it is, I'm, all, this is this, I'm, I'm coming to an end because we're gonna just talk close with this. The statement of the Jebusites. So David comes, he's wearing his authority. He's anointed king finally. And he got the crown in the worst place of his life in Ziglag, in the enemy's camp. Isn't that powerful? Are you at the worst place in your life? Reach for the crown, hallelujah, thank you. Thank you, Lord. just get the soul out of you, thank you, Lord. Anyway, so David, David is here and he's the, the Jebusites are on top of the battlements and they're saying, hey David, 
And David's here. I'm going to take your land. And the, and the Jebusites say this. Listen to the narrative because the devil talks to you the same way. He said, hey, David, what we're going to do is we're going to send you to fight you, the people that are blind, the people that are weak, and the people that are lame. In other words, an arm or something. We're going to send them down to you, and they're going to wipe you out. And David said, what did you say? He said, repeat it again. What did you say? He said, we're going to send you, because we don't have to fight you. We're going to send our weakest people to knock you and your soldiers out. You can't do this. We're going to send you the people that are blind. The pe our, our people that are blind, that are weak, and that are lame. We're going to send them out to you, and they're going to destroy you. And that's what the enemy tells you. You can't do it. You're so weak. You're always failing. Nothing good happens to you. You can't. Oh, you're not a fighter. All you do is keep falling down doing the same thing. You're never going to make it. Everybody say the Jebusite. Come on. Hijola like Now you're a Jebusite talking to you. So uh, this is powerful. Uh, it's so powerful. Because now David, watch this. David is now, he's there. And you know what? He's, he's extremely insulted. Like looking at his soldiers like, shh. And you know what he does? He turns around and tells the soldier, okay, guys, whoever makes it under that, whoever makes it into that gate, I'm going to give you this city and I'm going to do this. And guess what? Joab, the captain, says, I'll do it. So he starts strategizing and Joab says, ah, there's a water source there. So he dives in and he goes under the water, shh, and comes up on the other side. This is, he did this. And then he opens up the gate for David. And all the soldiers come in and they possess, they possess Jerusalem like this, like in a New York minute. And this is the power of God's word. Listen, you can possess what God has promised you. Listen, God has ordained you a king. Kings fight battles. Kings will be led by what? Everybody say the ephod. Come on. You got to be led by, you got to ask God, let him lead you and guide you. So what does David do now? In Israel right now, this is David's land, <laughs> Israel. They, they still have the city of David. We went to the city of David, so beautiful. You're in history, you're like, hijo, I remember this. So you're, you're, you're walking up in, in Israel, there's a whole land of olive trees, an olive where, where Jesus went on his knees and, and he said, not mine will be done, but thy will be done. You gotta go to Israel. I'm telling you, you gotta go, because if you know the word of God, you're like, oh, how beautiful. And then when I put my feet in the Sea of Galilee and took my shoes off and I said, the King of Glory put his feet on this water here and on this that His feet, the creator of the universe, the word became flesh and the, the word, the flesh, the word of God walked on this earth. His holy feet touched the land. And so you want to be stepping on that land, praise the Lord. Oh yeah. I felt the anointing. Of, oh man, the presence of God. You got to go to Israel. Yeah. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Anybody want the crown?